This is just a flying visit to tell you about the Eskimo curlew, an amazing bird, an incredible bird, an extinct bird, maybe, we don't know, but even the memory of them is gone. It wasn't always like this. Um, it's, it's, uh. They fell on us like heavy snow. So many on the tundra, it was like clouds of mosquitoes rising in front of a walking man. Nests and eggs in every tussock of grass. And the flock contained thousands of individuals, extending for a quarter of a mile in length and hundreds of yards or more in width. When such a flock would alight, the birds would cover 40 or so acres of ground. They haven't been seen for 50 years, but I live in hope. They bred or breed in the Arctic, carving out territories in the tundra, always returning to the same place. The male arrives early, staking his claim, defending it against intruders, waiting, waiting for the female to come. The brief annual cycle of life in the Arctic leaves little time for delay. Biological clock, tick, tock, tick. Wait, wait, watch the skies. Does anybody ever come? on the move. <laughs> Never settle. <laughs> Itchy feet. <laughs> anyway, um, days shorten and the decreasing sunlight reduces the activity of the bird's pituitary gland. The sex hormones <laughs> decrease and the bird's aggressive mating urge disappears and is replaced with the migratory urge. Migration. <laughs> The best time to be a birder. Big numbers passing overhead. Always a chance of seeing something rare. Sandpiper 
wimbrel, ruddy turnstone, golden plover. These birds have fattened up on the abundant insect life of the Arctic. The Eskimo curlew stops on the Labrador Peninsula to feast on curlew berries, as does the golden plover. The curlew is not alone now. Both birds fly at the same breathtaking speed, so they migrate together. From Labrador, they take the shorter but perilous sea route to South America. It is a 2,500-mile journey, non-stop for three days. They will lose a third of their body weight, spanning the length of a continent. Navigation. The Eskimo curlew's brain is delicately tuned to cosmic forces. Scientists believe that birds like the Eskimo curlew can actually see the Earth's magnetic field. The Herculean thrust of the migratory impulse carries the Eskimo curlew from the very northernmost to the very southernmost reaches of the Americas. Here, on the coasts of South America, the curlew begins to feel restless again. Searching the flocks of other shorebirds for a sign, for a signal that she is among them. And then suddenly, without warning, she is. Love alights when you least expect it. And there is truth and 
beauty and hope in the world. For the Eskimo Curlew, recognition is intuitive and instantaneous. He has never seen a member of his species before, but he will know exactly what to do. He feeds her a tiny morsel. If she accepts, their bond is sealed. For the Eskimo Curlew, flight is effortless. Each stroke of their wings, an intricate series of gracefully coordinated actions, merged with split-second precision into a single, smooth movement. The sturdy inner half of the wing, next to the body, deflects the airstream causing pressure below and suction above, giving lift, flight. The outer half of the wing, consisting of 10 stiff flight feathers, is the propeller, driving the bird forward. It is too fast for conscious control. Three or four wing beats a second, give the curlew a speed of up to 50 miles an hour. Two curlews flying together talk to each other constantly in the darkness. Soft, lisping notes that rise faintly above the whistle of air through their wings. When I am with my love, I begin to forget that I have ever known the torture of being alone. Heading north, they veer west, towards the towering Andes, spiraling up into air so thin that their wings beat as if in a vacuum. Their bills gape and their lungs strain for breath, attempting to clear those precipitous peaks. It is March. Far to the north, spring is greening the cottonwoods and prairie grasses. The Arctic is still 6,000 miles away, but it calls with a fever and a fierceness. The Eskimo curlew pair make another perilous sea crossing. Instead of following land, the isthmus of Panama, around to the Guatemalan highlands, they fly due north, across the Pacific. 24 hours of non-stop flight. But unlike the crossing of the Atlantic, this time they set off hungry. But they have each other. And if one slows, the other calls. A low, throaty courtship quirking, giving strength like no food or rest can. When they make landfall, they feed on newly hatched grasshoppers as they make their way around to the Yucatan Peninsula. 
and here they join with thousands of other birds. A bottleneck of migrating birds, cuckoos, thrushes, warblers, even tiny hummingbirds. A damned river of birds, all waiting for conditions to be right, to flow out across the Gulf of Mexico to North America, where, beyond swampy shores, by flat, unobstructed prairies, reaching almost all the way to the Arctic. When they reach those prairies, it is corn planting time. Great steel monsters roar like ocean surf, leaving black furrows of fresh turned soil in orderly ranks. The Eskimo curlew pair follow close behind, feasting on white grubs and cutworms, doing the farmers a great service. And yet it was here that they were slaughtered so relentlessly. During the spring flights, spring flights, the slaughter of these poor birds was appalling, appalling. and almost unbelievable. unbelievable. Hunters would drive out of Omaha and shoot the birds without mercy, mercy. until they literally slaughtered a whole wagon load of them. Wagon load. The wagon being actually filled, and with the sidebars out of that, sometimes when the flights were unusually heavy. Unusually and the hunters well supplied with ammunition. ammunition. Their wagons were too quickly and easily filled. Quickly and, easily filled. and so whole loads of birds would be dumped, dumped. on the prairie. prairie. Their bodies forming piles as large as a couple of tons of coal. Where they would be allowed to rot. As many as two million Eskimo curlews were killed every spring on those prairies towards the end of the 19th century. The courtship display flights, which have been gaining heat in the preceding weeks, now reach fever pitch. The male springs into the air, his love song wild and vibrant. He then flies straight up until he is a couple of hundred feet above the prairie where he hovers, calling down to the female, who bobs and whistles excitedly against the dark earth far below. Then he closes his wings and dives straight for her, landing a few feet away. She invites the climactic approach, bobbing with quivering wings Calling stridently. In the ecstasy of mating, they are blind to everything around them. Vulnerable. Thank you. 
Keep waiting. 